got an interesting lineup of speakers. A uh, couple of our speakers are joining virtually, and a couple of them are already here. So we already have uh, the government uh, startup and uh, the corporate side of uh, people representing uh, how they are adopting blockchain and how it has changed their operations for better efficiency. So uh, this time my other speakers joined virtually. I'm gonna start with the speakers already present here. Wait, background nikal diya bhai. Sorry, just uh, minute, you background just quickly yeah. just take 30 right, seconds right, right. of introducing yourself, then we'll get into the discussion uh -huh. more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good morning all. Uh, thank you, uh, Interpreter, uh, for inviting me to this uh, uh, event. Um, fantastic event. Uh, I'm practicing blockchain and emerging tech for the point, uh, uh, eight years now. Uh, blockchain specifically, uh, Pre-COVID and COVID, uh, it was uh, appraised uh, in a, in a uh, vertical group. Then later, because of other uh, uh, impact on regulations and other things, it, it went on flat. And other, now we all see enterprises and uh, you know, uh, countrywide across uh, 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 regions, it started picking up in terms of uh, 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 different use cases and so on and so forth. Uh, currently, uh, I'm part of NTM Maitri. I handle uh, technologies and uh, specific uh, domain and utilities as well. Thank you. Abhijan, over to you. A quick introduction. What does ML is into? So, hi, my name is Abhijan. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called Decimal, which is a startup which has recently started to provide the access to the data to Web3 and the blockchain space. Now, before this, I was part of the corporate structure for over 20 years and I've been in blockchain for past seven, eight years. Um, where I understand like where the traditional technologies and tra traditional companies are coming in from, the challenges that they are facing with respect to adoption of blockchain. There's a lot of other niche work that is happening in the startup space. So with my entry to the startup space was with the intention that how do I bridge that gap of data and bringing it back to both enterprises and make it more accessible for masses. So that's where, uh, what this is all about. So we also have uh, Dr. Jayesh Ranjan joining us virtually. Uh, virtually. Jayesh, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can. Hi, good morning. Good morning, good morning everyone. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, uh, can you give us a fair idea how uh, the government is currently adopting uh, these emerging technologies like blockchain and how it has further added in terms of uh, operational efficiency? Absolutely. So, uh, first of all, uh, greetings to everyone, all the speakers, panelists, all the members of the audience. First of all, my apologies that I'm not able to be there in person. I wanted to be there, but uh, uh, there are some <coughs> pressing commitments here in Madhubar. But nevertheless, I'm very happy that I'm getting this opportunity to share some thoughts with all of you through this uh, virtual mode. But before anything else, I would like to congratulate Entrepreneurs India for uh, putting together this conference and uh, taking up this topic, which is very, very important. So we all know that uh, technology today is becoming a far bigger game changer than what we had imagined, uh, let us say, a decade ago or even five years ago. At that point in time, a decade ago or five years ago, technology was seen as a luxury. I mean, of course, the big ones, the Fortune 500 companies and all, they used to have their own technology verticals or they used to source technologies from other vendors. But for a big scale company and a small company, it was not really uh, seen as something which is uh, affordable or accessible, but more than anything else, whether it is important or So, <clears throat> this is how the industry used to function for the past uh, so many decades. But for about a decade or so, things have started changing. And uh, particularly during the pandemic, after the pandemic, Everyone has come to the realization that if uh, one has to remain competitive, even uh, remain existent for that matter, not even to speak about comp being competitive, if you have to just survive also, there is no other option but to rely on technology. Of course, I mean both uh, recent technology as well as manufacturing technology. 
So this uh, old 19th century kind of thinking that I did not go to a college, I don't have a degree, I don't speak English, I will not be able to manage technology, it is only for those big companies. I mean that mindset I have to so it's a get rid of absolutely. Now, so once that is happening, that realization is happening, we have also seen a large number of technology providers creating solutions, creating products which are relevant for this medium scale enterprise, a small scale enterprise, pricing it in an affordable manner. Instead of making them buy a solution, offer solution as a service or a product as a service, unnecessary capex. So all kinds of innovations are happening. Of course, uh, adoption of all these innovations is uh, again, uh, I don't say uniform. It's not that everyone has lapped it up, but I uh, can see this fact that more and more companies are showing willingness. In fact, in uh, Telangana, I can share with you that in the last two years in particular, a large number of, uh, see, when we talk about MSMEs, it appears as if we are speaking about their modern strategy, but that is not really so. There are one M of this MSME is actually micro These which are literally home based industries which are functioning in a very traditional kind of a way. So we have noticed that uh, micro enterprises are uh, typically not very amenable to any kind of change. But as I said, in the last few years, two and a half years, I have seen many examples, many successes of even a micro enterpriser understanding that technology is important for them. They are adopting digital technologies. They have uh, seen uh, five, six years ago, micro enterprises typically would not even have an email address. If you wanted to contact the promoter, you would have to do it in a very old fashioned way. Because they would think that uh, even uh, having an email is something which is beyond that. Because they don't speak English, they have not gone to any college, etc. But things are changing. Email, of course, is very big picture. But beyond email also, they have now started uh, relying on, uh, they have, of course, other. For example, many of them use the tab or other accounting software. Many of them have uh, bought into some kind of ERP. They are also using a little bit of uh, e commerce depending upon the line of activity. So, some positive changes uh, happening. But the important fact to realize is that there are many technologies today which are not just important for your survival, but can give you a very important boost for your business. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, in today's conference, we are discussing a very potent technology, which is uh, blockchain, and uh, an offshoot of blockchain, which is Web 3.0. Now, there are uh, amazing uh, use cases, which we ourselves have uh, delivered in the state of Telangana using blockchain. And uh, I have also noticed that uh, there are some industry verticals in particular which are benefiting greatly from applications of blockchain. Most of you would be aware that Hyderabad and Telangana are very important sectors for life science. In fact, the country's uh, 40% pharmaceutical manufacturing happens in Hyderabad. Lots of uh, vaccine manufacturing, in fact, one third of global vaccine manufacturing happens in Hyderabad. And uh, unfortunately, so it is a matter of great uh, shame and regret, but that is unfortunately a reality that we also see a huge market of what is called studious drugs, fake drugs. So, uh, I mean, obviously you are playing with lives of people if you introduce fake drugs or studious drugs, but there are uh, unscrupulous people in our place who are doing that. But what is the responsibility of the government there? So how can we ensure that we are able to distinguish between a genuine drug and a studious drug and a fake drug? So blockchain provides very important solution. And uh, to begin with, we have started uh, de deploying it for the cancer cure medicines. Cancer, as you know, is a very uh, kind of a, a, a disease which many, on many, many cases leads to fatality. So how do you ensure that uh, cancer drugs are uh, correctly identified and delivered? We also, as well as also is a very important sector for seed products. As many of you would know, this is this city is called this region is called rather the seed bowl of the country. There are more than uh, 100 companies which uh, do R and D and processing and manufacturing of seeds. Again, many of you would know that fake seeds, India seeds, uh, is again a big menace. So here also we use blockchain to do this uh, tracing and tracking. 
food processing industry also is benefiting, particularly those which have to export in maintaining this uh, traceability. Because if you are farming yourself an organically grown uh, fruit or vegetable which can have a distinct market in the West, how do you ensure that that uh, link is established, traceability is established? It's a very good uh, block, blockchain solution. So many good initiatives of blockchain are happening in our state and as a government we are supporting the profit. Web 3.0 is again something which is very promising. In our country, the stand on Web 3.0 is a bit ambiguous because of uh, association with cryptocurrency. Yeah. Again, many of uh, you in the audience would know that uh, there's a strong pushback from the Reserve Bank, from the Central Bank, the main regulator, which uh, also has its own justification. I'm not saying that they are unnecessarily pushing back because there have been issues of uh, investors' uh, uh, protection and things like that. We have seen so many high profile cases where uh, people's entire lifetime savings have been wiped out due to again frauds and things like that. So RBI obviously has to play that role in uh, taking care of uh, fraud, etc. But, uh, but the issue is that uh, <coughs> but the issue is that when we are of course rally and much cautious about uh, crypto. What about other use cases of that three point? We know that uh, there are amazing use cases of that three point asset optimization is one example which comes to mind with it. Uh, are they then in a way signaling that nothing of uh, the three point will be encouraged in the country? And the reality is that a few years ago that signaling actually happened. And uh, uh, we discovered it in a very roundabout way. We were attending a global conference at the World Economic Forum event in Davos. There someone told us, one of the big VC representatives told us that many promising Indian startups are, are, the, are uh, many promising Indian startups are shifting their base to a Dubai or a Singapore because the regulatory environment in India is not continuing. They are getting pushed out of the region. And when we learned about it, of course, some of the issues related to government of India, but as a state we decided. As a state, we decided that we will take control of the situation. So, I'm very happy to share with you that two years ago, we introduced, we started a regulatory sandbox on the Uber. And uh, I'm very happy to share with you that uh, the first cohort, which has eight uh, startups, again addressing different uh, aspects of the uh, Uber solution, excluding crypto. Have uh, successfully completed their first cohort. We were able to get support from lots of law firms, firms which are on the interface of technology and uh, regulation. They individually mentored all these startups, many of the national regulators, including RBI, including SEBI, including the IRDA. They participated in this sandbox. The state government, of course, was there to provide data and other kind of support. And uh, that experience has been very positive, of course. With just eight startups in a first cohort, we will not be able to really move the needle. But the process has begun. We are starting the second cohort, possibly from the month of uh, April. And uh, this time we will try to get more diversity in the cohort. We are now okay to even include a few crypto based uh, kind of solutions and uh, so on and so forth. So, Web 3.0, as I mentioned, is an emerging kind of application. As a state, we are doing our bit to ensure that uh, unnecessary regulatory hurdles don't come in the way because of which whatever is good which can potentially come out of that 3.0, we miss out on that as well. And tomorrow, the industry will be beneficial. Just as I mentioned, the pharma industry, the seed industry, the food processing industry, and so many others who are benefiting from uh, blockchain. Many others will benefit from uh, Web 3.0 also. If uh, asset tokenization, for example, is uh, allowed and encouraged, look at the way it can transform property interest, the real interest, real estate interest. There are lots of uh, fintech uh, financial uh, uh, lending companies, NPFCs, etc., where people can be a boom for them. So, potentially, it can disturb many industries. We in Telangana are trying to pave the way for this to be adopted at a bigger level. Blockchain adoption is already happening at a very, very advanced state. There is nothing more that as a state we can do except to open up our doors to more and more uh, solution providers and link them to potential companies who can get the market access. But Web 3.0, we need to do this gradually, incrementally, and most importantly, collaboratively. We need to 
bring the regulators, state regulators, national regulators. We need to bring the startups. We need to bring the law firm. And as a government, we need to kind of stitch everything together as an integrator. So I'm uh, happy to kind of uh, interact offline with members of the audience who have interest in both uh, blockchain and web three point zero. As I said, had I been there in person, I would have definitely loved to meet as many people as possible. But uh, while I'm not there, I will request the organizers to at least pass my mail ID, my contact details to people who are interested to get in touch. But uh, nevertheless, uh, my good wishes for the success of uh, this conference. Unfortunately, as I told you, I have uh, pressing engagements in Hyderabad, so I have to leave uh, with this. But uh, I would love to get uh, updated on what all discussions happened today. And is there anything which makes uh, relevance for the state to really support and collaborate in the field? But thank you very much for uh, having me and giving me this opportunity. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, Dr. Karthik is also here from Apollo. Dr. Karthik, uh, welcome. Uh, I hope you can hear us all. Yes, thank you so much. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Karthik, I wish to know from you uh, as a hospital chain, how are you? Uh, technologies like blockchain and uh, how have they further helped in streamlining operations uh, in a hospital setup? Absolutely. So once again, good morning to all of you and thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Jayesh's presentation was very enlightening and I could take a few cues from what he mentioned about what uh, Telangana has been doing in healthcare because some of those applications are applicable to us as well within the hospital sector. Uh, so, and again, I wish I could have been there in person, but again, there were some pressing commitments at my end too, because of which I could not be there in person, but I really uh, cherish this opportunity that we're discussing a very relevant topic. Broadly, if I were to look at what are the core applications that we as a healthcare organization are looking at, and uh, some of my responses are more industry relevant responses, need not be specific to what we do at Apollo Hospitals. Uh, broadly, we look, we're looking within healthcare at around five major applications where blockchain has been extremely helpful and relevant. Uh, I think post-COVID, the kind of digital uh, and technology transformation and adoption that we have seen in healthcare is uh, humongous. So just a case in point, uh, just before COVID, uh, you know, if you were to look at the baseline of number of teleconsultations or video consultations that we used to do as a healthcare organization, of connecting a doctor with a patient using technology and compare that baseline towards what we did during COVID and now post COVID, we've seen about a 10 to 12x growth in the volume of consultations, in the volume of telemedicine consultations and transactions that we do. Same is the case what we have noted on the, uh, the e-pharmacy and the e-lab app that we have. We have Apollo 24 seven, uh, which is the largest downloaded healthcare app uh, in this part of the world. And, you know, in addition to that, we see that the number of transactions that people do in terms of, you know, the number of uh, pharmaceutical transactions, the number of lab investigation transactions that we do, that has grown almost six to eight X as well. So there has to be a technology that supports authenticity of transactions, authenticity of data within this entire universe of uh, what we do as digital health transactions. Uh, so that is where I think blockchain comes in uh, very, very uh, handy and it's been very helpful for us there. So the five major areas, if I may, uh, where we are really truly focusing on leveraging the benefit of blockchain is number one, patient data and patient data management. And as you know, in patient data management, privacy is of a significant importance uh, because health data is, is, very, is something that's very personal. And hence, uh, managing privacy and managing authenticity of health data is, is critical as well, so that uh, only if the doctor has access to the right information that's authentic is when you'll be able to give offer the right kind of treatment and the right kind of prognosis uh, as well. And a lot of um, diseases these days are non-communicable diseases, which are chronic, which are for the long term, including, I do understand uh, what Mr. Ranjan mentioned about cancer. So cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, these are all conditions that are for a lifetime and therefore managing authentic clinical data over a lifetime, over a long period of time is very critical to see the way how we manage these disorders or diseases. So patient data, that's number one. Number two is clinical trials. So as you know, 
clinical trials are the only way to say how effective a certain new medicine is and what are if at all there are any side effect concerns or safety concerns what is it that one needs to watch out for so therefore the authenticity of clinical trial data is very critical some years ago in our country there had been certain instances where there were questions raised about how authentic is the clinical trial data uh, with it from that are captured from some of the indian clinical trial sites so that used to be a cause of concern some years ago and it's no longer true because we now have blockchain that's able to truly uh, you know assess and ensure that whatever clinical trial data that is collected is authentic so second is clinical trials third is pharmaceutical supply chains which arunjan brought this up really well where uh, you know uh, spurious drugs have always been a significant cause of concern and especially more expensive the drug uh, more the number of uh, you know what you call spurious uh, drug players that that play in such market cancer medicines is one very good example that mr ranjan brought out insulin is another one uh, biologic drugs as we call injectable vaccines and biologic drugs this is the third example where a lot of Uh, spurious drugs are traditionally seen in the market, and blockchain helps fix that issue using technology. The fourth is telemedicine, and the fifth is health data exchange. To summarize, so patient data, clinical trial, pharmaceutical supply chain management, telemedicine, and health data exchange. These are the five major areas where uh, blockchain is truly revolutionizing uh, data authenticity uh, within healthcare. And uh i'd like to give a few examples of organizations or technology service providers who have been doing very well uh, in this space so if i were to talk about the first topic which is uh, patient data management so we have some real world examples in the form of a company called burst iq so burst iq has been in the forefront of uh, blockchain to revolutionize uh, patient data management Uh, as as already mentioned storing sharing and managing sensitive health data is critical and that's still precisely where our secure solution uh, comes in handy it even helps secure bank account details because today a lot of the health payment towards healthcare so a patient coming in for an outpatient or an inpatient uh, 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 treatment or a medical service uh, today pays uh, pays their consultation fee or pays the hospital uh, service fee digitally so securing bank account details and securing digital transactions that patients do within the healthcare system is critical and that's what this solution provides us as well another example is a company called lifegraph they use uh, web3 ready blockchain technology and again extremely handy extremely uh, useful as well in terms of ensuring health data security so broadly the benefit in this space of uh, basically uh enhancing patient data management are three one is security of data second is immutability and third is interoperability these are the three major benefits we see here on the second topic of optimizing clinical trial reports the one of the good examples of this technology is a company called guard time and guard time has been using blockchain to secure and streamline clinical trial reports and they ensure data integrity and there is no falsification of clinical trial data so therefore the uh, main benefits here of uh, blockchain in clinical trial data management is data integrity which ensures data authenticity and uh, integrity of the clinical trial data and second is consensus mechanism so where if you are required to get agreement between multiple clinical trial sites and multiple investigators from across the world this technology also helps bring that consensus as well in the clinical trial environment so these are two major advantages in the third vertical which is pharmaceutical supply chain management one of the core companies uh, that are well known here is a company called chronicle and they are truly helping us to leverage technology to uh, fight the issue of counterfeit drugs so that's been uh, very very uh, useful technology and so is a company called medilecture uh, which is which is also another company which which works uh, very well in this setting so what this will uh, enables is one end to end traceability so right from manufacturing to it reaching the retail pharmacy you are able to trace and track the original drug and anywhere if there is a break in the chain which is a potential red flag for a counterfeit drug you get to know it immediately second it also helps monitor drug life cycle as you know medicines have an expiry date so monitoring the authenticity and the validity of the uh, life span of the medicine is important so that is also another a uh, key advantage we get from this technology coming to telemedicine and remote monitoring robo robo 
COVID and focus on the, uh, you know, uh, it, an established uh, technologies in this, where it ensures uh, enhanced security and also integration with point of care devices. A lot of people use glucometers, blood pressure monitors, uh, digitally enabled uh, insulin pens, you have in Bluetooth technology, thermometers having Bluetooth technology. There are multiple point of care devices which can be integrated uh, into the IoT network where patients can monitor vital signs from their home, send the data in a secure platform to their doctor and the doctor can visualize remotely how is the patient doing, look at the parameters and advise uh, sequential consultations. And lastly, interoperable health data exchange where uh, Avenir Health is one of the key technology service providers there which is truly helping with decentralized architecture which allows multiple participants to access the same data set enhancing data availability and efficient claims processing, especially in health insurance claim processing, where we see that the claim is authentic, data provided in the claim is authentic, and once these two are taken care of, actually it reduces the claim processing time and hence enhancing efficiency. So broadly, these are the areas where we uh, in the healthcare system are really uh, seeing a lot of value being brought in by uh, blockchain. And uh, I hope uh, to collaborate with a lot many members who may be interested in looking at these healthcare applications uh, with blockchain technology. And uh, so uh, look forward to collaborating. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Dr. Kandik, for joining and sharing your inputs. Uh, Ravi, coming to you. Uh, I want to understand because since you mentioned it, it, it's been seven, eight years since uh, you started adopting blockchain uh, and the technology. Uh, any specific use cases you want to discuss about how it has further helped uh, a tech company like uh, NGI Bindery? Uh, okay, the data and what are information providing are very personal experience, you know, experience and uh, you know, it's like a particular uh, disclaimer. But uh, it's more of across industry sector, right? So, uh, specifically, uh, being a data, data transaction standpoint, I would put blockchain in three or four segments. One is uh, or a theme, okay? Uh, one is you can look at blockchain as more of a collaboration and registry, data registry. Uh, where it could, uh, you know, you have decentralized uh, data coming in and you can pull those set of data as a start point for a verifiable connections or information set to start point, actually, right? Whatever uh, the client process you refer to. You didn't have start point. But before you start, you have to do a climb check. Uh, the other set of themes is, uh, uh, what I can say is, uh, uh, the analytic set of data in terms of exchange, information exchange, right? That is one set of uh, where you can create application between enterprise for transaction purpose. It is business real time information set. That is the area where you get supply chain information, where you get uh, like. Third of this trade exchange, which is in real time. At the same time, it provides optimal information for the end consumer to start up, you know, to provide uh, uh, do business, right? Uh, for example, uh, in terms of renewable energy, in terms of carbon credits, in terms of uh, uh, you know, energy commodities, right? These are the areas. Finally, a subset of trade exchange are the payment which is future. Today we are India is a different infrastructure, but future if you want to do all digitally, specifically I'm saying on crypto I'm saying talking about digital currency based payments is through blockchain. So these are the set of use cases. After three four themes you have. That's what I would do. Yeah. Thank you. So Ajita, coming to you, I mean how has your journey been like uh, blockchain adoption uh, in the country and uh, how has been the response like in the industry so far? Uh, so I'll take that question and continue with the response to what Ravi has mentioned, right? So basically, I have always found that blockchain beyond just being a technology, it is also a different mindset of doing business, right? The traditional way of doing business is basically where we were holding the data. The data was controlled by some entity and they were the ones who were controlling it. Another way of looking at it is that 
everyone says that it is that they know the best way of reaching out to the customer. But the truth of the matter is the end customer actually knows what they want. And giving that power to them is what will drive higher innovations and faster uh, basically growth of the country, right? So that's basically where I would say the pivot is about looking at from bottom up rather than top down, right? We sitting in a central or high corner, corner office and then saying we know best what is required by the customer is basically what is changing. So basically it is a different way of looking at data instead of holding the data, controlling the data, it is all about cooperation. And cooperation not only with respect to partners and vendors, it is also against competitors also. Because overall, again, I am taking the example of Mr. Karthik itself, who is talking from the Apollo perspective. Now, there are many other companies who are in competition with Apollo, but their end goal is actually the betterment and the better health providing for the citizens or people. If every and every company is actually struggling with the same problems, right? If we can make sure that they can have a consolidated and collaborative approach towards solutions that are industry wide, I think we can get better results and better outcomes. So it is all about cooperation, collaboration, and uh, the term that Ravi mentioned is uh, about we have a term called enterprise resource planning, right? Which is within the company. We call blockchain as network resource planning, where networks are collaborating, interacting, sharing data, and we can be assured that irrespective of your individual tech stack or individual business fundamentals internal to the company, you can collaborate and share information that is actually authentic. So that is like you don't have to go back and do validations for every transaction that is coming in. You can just go frictionless in terms of the data that is being provided to you, be it from a competitor, be it from a vendor, be it from a partner. You can be assured that yes, it is actually right without having to blindly trust anyone. You can trust the technology. Open the floor for questions. One last question I have. Uh, Ravi, I want to understand. I mean, uh, as a corporate, when you look at an emerging technology like blockchain, uh, I mean, uh, what kind of, uh, I would say, I mean, uh, some data check you do at your end uh, to understand, okay, this is something to be adopted for a longer last run, and what kind of, uh, I mean, uh, time frame for a new emerging technology, and what kind of investment you put in place for that? Yeah, fantastic question. So we qualify, uh, uh, we qualify uh, use cases, specifically uh, domain-specific use cases, and classify it to three areas: horizontal world, horizontal two, horizontal three. Horizontal world will be zero to two years, and uh, then there's two to four years, and so on, right? But how do we, you know, how do we match to the world, right? The real world, right? It, it has to go lab to market step. So, um, across industry vertical sector, right, there are three sectors, three C, business as usual, but uh, when you do business as usual, what are the changes you can bring in, specifically uh, compliance, regulation related, policy related, or uh, revenue education within that space. So you can do blockchain in that space, but in, within, the, within the, the big enterprises with the set of partners, for example, SaaS. Yeah, that is one segment of it. Another segment of it is uh, the digital transformation. I have 10 lakh customers. How do I leave it to one customers? What all I should do? What uh, what all I should do? Which is a core, right? Blockchain is a core, and what other technology should be bring And conceptualize, understand what needs to be done. What are the business use case? What are the outcome? What are the impact it will give? What is the market? All that analysis will be done. By doing that, we will understand what kind of a transformation leap we are taking. For example, uh, supply chain is one of the areas, which is good. Another area is uh, 
which is which is towards the market. I'm not checking it. That way I, I can talk. Like for example, forward to information. For example, very famous in the niche. You know, uh, and uh, uh, cross country trade, trade related. Borders trade. I hear about that. So these are the country level. But corporate enterprises, they think about supply chain, page of order, other partners, vendor partner ecosystem. Third one is the uh, uh, the uh, customer use cases which they have to and have to support that. So this this area is uh, what we could say is predominantly we put money in this transformation. However, the third point is innovation. New revenue models. We want new revenue. We want to get into a new area and see. So predominantly between the second or third one. Third is taken into a research based, uh, for example, energy localization. Right? That's one space. Other area is about the, uh, if you if I talk about way of science, financial services, you know, between primary and secondary market, capital market sector. Right? These are the research based area which is coming up because more towards regulation, more towards country regulation. So these are all upward looking for. Industry or a government infrastructure to become first, then they get the right. Where you find need to go to market with the blockchain and the those happy tools are supply chain, a rope which is very well thought, brought up a vertical part. Yeah, that's what I would like to present. And uh, 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 if you could say most of the corporate enterprises they have book on the second part of it are this transformation. Innovations are a bucket very specific to set up. I would actually uh, add to what Rani just mentioned, right? The innovation part of that, right? Innovation actually is, again, I'll repeat the part that I was mentioning earlier, is basically incentivizing the common people to actually participate, experiment. And for that, they need access to that blockchain verified authentic data. The more that we are able to make it more accessible, more that we are able to have participation from the public, startup, and ecosystem, and there is a better incentive mechanism that can be built up. I'm very sure that we can see a lot more innovation that will help. So, peer to peer, peer to peer energy transit in Uttar Pradesh has happened. So, that's one example. And first, sorry, huh? one more use case, what you referred to is the dry use case of uh, do not disturb of the uh, SM, you know, SMS thing. That is a what? Very good infrastructure for the government standpoint given to us. It's used by us or not, but all the telcos came together and put that infrastructure for us. It's their feeling. Interesting. So, uh, since we are short on time, I'm sorry, we'll have to take the questions offline. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us here and for the wonderful discussion and uh, unlocking the blockchain for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.